Around the world, science and technology are moving exponentially faster than the laws that supposedly regulate them. We've discovered DNA, we've mapped the human genome, and we now offer discount direct-to-consumer genetic testing. Novel technologies solve pressing problems, but they also force us to confront new issues with uncertain consequences. It's unclear how the law should or can respond to the dilemmas these technologies create. There are two haunting examples of what happens when technology outpaces law. Ghost sperm and ghost guns. Now the ghost sperm controversy began decades ago when a few doctors exploited new reproductive technologies to inseminate unsuspecting patients with their own sperm without patients' knowledge or consent. Patients were told that the donors were medical students or even their husbands, but these fictitious donors were phantoms. This deceit has been revealed through genetic testing technologies, which also have exposed law's inability to hold these doctors accountable. Now, like ghost sperm, ghost guns raise questions of trust, only with untraceable weapons. 3D printing allows amateur gun makers worldwide to distribute blueprints and print plastic ghost guns, and countries and courts are struggling to limit their dissemination to protect public safety. Together, these case studies prompt us to examine whether and how law should respond to technologies that create life and take life. In the 1970s and 80s, women whose husbands were infertile visited respected physicians to undergo artificial insemination, supposedly with sperm from their husbands or physically similar medical residents. But decades later, the children they had conceived, now adults, purchased direct-to-consumer genetic testing kits, spit in vials, and mailed the kits off. Eager to learn more about their ethnicity and genetics, these folks then logged on for testing results, only to see unexpected branches of their family trees. Some hadn't known they were donor-conceived, and none could have expected they were doctor-conceived. Can you imagine what this must feel like? Fertility fraud is undeniably traumatic. It's decimated identities, it's torn families apart, and brought new families together. Former patients feel sexually violated. They love their children, but never wanted their doctor to father their child. Some adult children feel they were born from rape and are angry and sad their parents didn't tell them how they were conceived. They have to adjust to knowing they aren't genetically related to beloved relatives and decide how to interact with new relatives who are total strangers. Victims are usually ignored or rejected by the doctor's children who are also their half-siblings. Doctors, for their part, claim they had good intentions or were acting in patients' best interests or that patients weren't harmed because they had the children they wanted. Fertility fraud cases now span the globe, most dating from the 1970s and 80s. Some doctors did this a shocking number of times. U.S. doctor Donald Klein has 76 deceived offspring. Some were terribly negligent. The late Dutch doctor Jan Karbat, with 50 deceived offspring, had his clinic shut down by the state. And many were leading luminaries in their field. One Canadian doctor with 17 deceived offspring was past president of the Canadian Fertility Society and received the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal and the Order of Canada. Isn't this disgusting? Yet our communities and courts are confused. It's unclear how to handle fertility fraud cases that fall within legal gaps. Is this activity assault or rape? What about decades old evidentiary issues? First, there's no international consensus on how to regulate fertility treatment, donor conception, or direct to consumer genetic testing. Several European countries cover fertility treatment in national health plans and closely regulate it, but US law doesn't. The US and Europe also have different approaches to children's rights and to anonymous egg and sperm donation. International agreements support a child's rights to know their parents' identities and medical history, but these don't apply in the United States. There is no international registry of sperm donors. No international laws require countries to track donors or mandate anonymity or limit how many times a donor can donate or how many offspring they can have or require banks to simply notify families of important donor medical updates. Third, it's unclear how to punish the doctors involved. Criminal charges are difficult. Juries might not even consider fertility fraud to be rape 
or even assault just because it wasn't violent. Jurors might also think that women consented to undergo the insemination procedure and that their desire for a child justified the doctor's deception. It's hard to bring claims from decades ago. Medical malpractice suits might not be a great option either because claims expire quickly and some courts have decided that only parents can sue and dismiss adult children who weren't yet conceived. A lawsuit is even harder to bring in Europe. Carbat's Dutch patients and their adult children had to sue first to preserve and test Carbat's DNA after he died. They had to sue again to have it tested against their own DNA and then sue a third time for damages. So what are victims to do? Some have gone public, some have sued, and some have tried to pass new laws. To date, victims in four U.S. states have passed new laws since 2019 that criminalize fertility fraud, allow mothers, fathers, and their adult children to sue doctors, and give them more time to do so. Victims can tell their stories to the media and educate the public, and also alert other families who use the same physician. And fertility fraud runs deeper than deceptive doctors. Sperm banks have also deceived patients, giving them the wrong donor sperm, using donors with genetic conditions, and mis misrepresenting donors' characteristics and health history. In the recent case Norman versus Zytex Corporation, sperm bank Zytex allegedly told several families that donor 9623 had an IQ of 160, no criminal history or mental illness, great musical talent, spoke four languages, and was a doctoral student in neuroscience engineering. Sounds great, right? But in reality, donor 9623 was diagnosed with schizophrenia, arrested for burglary, had dropped out of college, and had been involuntarily institutionalized for mental health concerns. U.S. law at the time didn't require Zytex to ask for medical records, perform a drug test, or even conduct a criminal background check. But after families sued, courts dismissed that lawsuit, reasoning that a child's birth could not be a legal harm and that it was impossible to weigh the worth of donor 9623's children against those from a different donor with the expected characteristics. The children's very existence then shielded Zytex from liability. It wasn't until October 2020 that a state Supreme Court reconsidered this case and sent it back for a new trial. These ghost sperm cases clearly illustrate technology's wonders and woes and reveal law's limits. Law can't take away victims' emotional pain and physical distress. It can't compel doctors to reveal their motives for such gross behavior. It can't heal adults' genetic conditions or men-family relationships ravaged by physicians' deceit. But awareness of these developments has spurred advocacy and reform. Now, as a parallel to ghost sperm that remains undetected for decades, there are also ghost guns. Untraceable weapons that anyone with a 3D printer can make from plastic using downloaded plans. These guns don't have serial numbers, and they can be melted down after criminal use. They can be made by children, people with serious mental illness, and those who have committed violent crimes without a background check or training. These guns do have one metal part, usually a firing pin, but if this part is removed, ghost guns can pass unnoticed through scanners in public buildings and at airports. And 3D gun blueprints introduce a Pandora's box problem. Once uploaded to the internet and downloaded, they escape into the world and cannot be recaptured. Like ghost sperm, Europe regulates ghost guns differently than the United States, where it's legal to make and own a firearm intended for personal use that is never sold. New Jersey and California prohibit unregistered 3D weapons. Now the UK's laws are very similar. In 2019, in fact, a London student was convicted of illicitly printing a fully functional firearm. The European Union strictly regulates all firearms manufacturing under its firearms directive, which requires all essential firearm components to be marked. But it's the regulation of ghost gun blueprints that's really of interest, since these plans can be downloaded by anyone around the world. One important case from 2013 originated in the US but had subsequent poli political and legal implications that greatly affected other countries. A company called Defense Distributed uploaded to the internet plans for a blocky one bullet firearm called the Liberator, which often exploded when tested. Under President Obama, the US State Department found that Defense Distributed was exporting weapons outside the US without a license and ordered it to take down the blueprints. But the company sued, arguing it had freedom of speech 
to distribute the plans. The U.S. government suddenly reversed course under Trump when the State De Department abruptly announced that Defense Distributed could resume online disseminations. Several states then filed a lawsuit to stop this in the name of public safety, and a federal court reversed the State Department's decision. Meanwhile, untold numbers of blueprints have been downloaded and are still in circulation through a decentralized international network of gun advocates who exchange plans across digital platforms. Ghost sperm and ghost guns both illustrate the technological tensions between chaos and order, innovation and abuse. Reproductive technologies and 3D printing have enabled wondrous advances, even as they allow new forms of exploitation and deception. These spooky examples remind us both of how urgently we must reimagine legal solutions to these technological Pandora's boxes and of what's at stake in case we get it wrong. Law is the yin to technology's yang. The two must be in balance. Until we solve these dilemmas, we must rely on others to safeguard our interests. Patients must trust their doctors to verify that the correct sperm is used, and we must trust security officials to ensure that that plastic firearm isn't in a suitcase passing through the scanner in front of us at the airport. We are now at a crossroads in terms of choosing how law should deal with its lagging relevance. Should we regulate quickly to preempt harm at the risk of imposing heavy-handed rules that stifle innovation? Or should law step into line behind technology and allow it to lead the way, cleaning up the messes that are sure to result? There are some general solutions we can explore, including streamlining procedures for government agencies to make new rules and allowing industry self-regulation with government oversight. Some technologies can't be made safer, and their risks are infinitely higher than their rewards. These are the tough cases where governments must decide whether to prohibit certain acts. But other cases are much easier. It's never lawful for a doctor to use sperm to which the patient hasn't consented, and it's all but impossible to safeguard the public from untraceable plastic firearms. Thus, both ghost sperm and ghost guns must be exorcised, the former out of horror for what has already occurred, and the latter to avoid the terror of what could happen.